everybody and welcome to the 2024 food season. It is fantastic to see you all here tonight and to see everybody here in person at the British Library and also welcome everybody who is joining us online. Um, we are the Food Season team. My name is Polly Russell. I'm the director of the Food Season. I just could not do it though without this amazing team. Um, Angela Clutton, Melissa Thompson, and Joe Allen, um, guest directors, guest directors, amazing and lovely uh, assistant. You've pro anyone here who's a friend of the food season will have heard from us all. Um, it is fantastic to be here tonight. And thank you, everybody who supports the food season, especially Mila, who are sponsoring this year. We're absolutely thrilled and delighted about that. The food season every year, now in its sixth year, celebrates all aspects of food with some of the most exciting voices in food. And we just could not be more thrilled to be kicking off 2024 with this evening's event about Le Gavroche, celebrating the amazing achievements of that restaurant and its legacy and dynasty. It is, of course, a great honour to have Angela Hartnett be chairing that event. She's a chef, she's a presenter. I think she is, she's probably now a national treasure. I think she's almost a national treasure. I don't know if she likes that or not. Um, she has worked her way up through um, restaurants to a Michelin star, working with people like Gordon Ramsay and Marcus Waring. Her affiliation with the Gavroche goes back for many years, her work as a judge in La Rue Scholarship. She's the most incredible champion of hospitality, raising standards of food in this country and beyond, and passing the baton to the next generation, as has the Gavroche and the Rue family. So it's absolutely perfect that she is chairing this evening's event. So huge thanks to her, huge thanks to everybody at Le Gavroche, and huge thanks to you, and let's welcome this fantastic panel for this evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so, I think you all know why you're here, but I will do a few brief intros. <laughs> um, so, on my far right, we have the award-winning chef, Stephen Doherty, who began as a commie under Chef Albert Roux in 1978, raising, rising to a sous-chef level at 82, and later became the head chef. He made history as the first British chef to lead a three-star Michelin restaurant, holding the position for four years before becoming group executive chef of all the Rue operations. Well done, Stephen. <laughs> Emily Rue, here, on my right here, is the youngest of the Rue culinary dynasty. Not the last. She has two children, <laughs> so we watch this space. Um, daughter of Michelle and granddaughter of the late Albert, Emily spent her early career training as a chef in France before working for a restaurant's associates. She opened her first restaurant in Notting Hill, Caracteur, with her husband Diego in 19, uh, sorry, in 2018. Sorry, 90, I was giving you older then. <laughs> and is doing phenomenally well. She's now currently on the Ruth Scholarship with myself and Rachel, and she's just brilliant. I love Emily. She's a great girl. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, we have the legend that is Michelle Rue, one of Britain's leading chefs, part of that iconic Rue culinary dynasty perhaps most well known for running the Gavroche, which he took over from his father in 1991. He's the author of several cookbooks. He's an amazing regular on TV. And just, I think, an all-out national treasure, Michelle. I think you're... No, you're the treasure, well. not me. Oh. <laughs> so, I just want to paint, before we start this, sort of three things I'd like to discuss, and hopefully we'll open questions to the wider audience. The history of the Gavroche. Um, and the legacy and what it means to this country, how it was, you working in the Gavroche, you as, I feel, like children of the Gavroche, both of you were brought up in the Gavroche, and then where we sort of see it's, what it's left and the influence of French food on the UK. So I'd like to start by just um, playing a little bit of uh, Albert's voice, just to um, mm. put us in the mood. So if we could have clip one, please. What is health? I would rather say to you, what is happiness? Well, food is the essential part 
of your life because no food, no life. So you may as well enjoy what you're eating. But the pleasure of food, you don't need caviar, you don't need foie gras, you don't need smoked salmon. You know, you need nice things, fresh things. Don't need to be expensive. Eating well has got nothing to do with cost. It's what you put in it. The love to make it beautiful. I think Albert said it all there, but what I'd love to know, because you were about seven or eight years old when Albert and Michelle opened the Gavroche, and then five years later, I think, they opened the Waterside Inn. How was that, growing up with, in that restaurant? I mean, yeah. and then going on to be a chef yourself, where was the pressure? Was it, son, this is you next, <laughs> blah, 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 or were you allowed to be free? How, did, how was that? Um, well, it was, first off, that was really wise words by the old man there, wasn't it? It was uh, very, very beautiful to, to listen to and to, to be able to hear his voice again. But, um, uh, I mean, my, my first memories of Le Gavroche uh, in uh, the old Gavroche, where, where you did a few years as well as a young to chef. Together. Uh, yeah, together. Um, I mean, in 1967, when, when it first opened, and I would visit with my mum after school to go and see Dad, it was quite scary. Mm. I mean, it was uh, Lower Stone Street, and the kitchen was downstairs in the basement. And you, the, the, the back door, there was a certain, as soon as you opened it, there was a rush of hot air uh, and the smell of the kitchen. Uh, and because, I mean, the ventilations were terrible in those days. And, and actually, the, the staircase coming up from the kitchen <laughs> was part of the ventilation, wasn't it? It was, <laughs> it was drawing out the heat of the kitchen and the smells. And, and walk down the stairs and walked past terrines of foie gras cooling down on the stairs. On the was, stairs. There were no blast chillers then. It was just the, the air coming out. And, <laughs> and, and tiptoeing past all this food and the further down the stairs, the louder the noise would be and the, the, the heat was intense. Yeah, sure. And then finally getting down to the bottom of the stairs and the, the intensity of the heat and the frenetic movement of father and uncle and all the chefs there and the banging of pans and the smell... It was really, really intense. Uh, food. Did you no. feel I want to be in that? <laughs> and not at not at that age, no, no. not at seven year old. I mean, yeah. I was more more sort of scared than anything yeah. else. But I mean, it was great to get a oh sisters. It was great to get a um, a little madeleine from from my uncle or mm. a little macaroon or something freshly mm. cooked. It's only further down when I, when I was sort of twelve, thirteen. Yeah. That. Um, that I, I, I kind of realised that, yes, this is, this is what I want to do. Mm. I'm probably similar ages, anyway. Yeah. And you felt the same, Emily, when you had that experience? Yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities in, 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 yeah. in what you said. Um, well, I didn't really come after school because that wasn't on the way. <laughs> no, you weren't. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't you weren't going to Mayfair home. on your way home. No. <laughs> um, but the Saturday evenings that I did yeah. spend in the kitchen... Um, it was a bit of a playground. It was, you know, I just, I just loved it. I loved yeah. the camaraderie. I loved the family essence of it. Um, it was essentially fun. Mm. Um, getting covered in tomato peelings yeah. and everything. And <laughs> Potatoes, <laughs> whatever, whatever they could have me do yeah. um, throughout the service to yeah. um, keep me occupied, basically. And I loved it. And you loved it and felt, this is for me. Yeah, definitely, 100%. But you didn't feel a pressure to then take mm. over from your father? No. Different conversation. <laughs> Different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But good. Okay. Well, happy you've gone on your own. Um, and going back to that, you know, that it was, I mean, I've got my little dates here. So it opened in 67. In 81, it moved up to Upper Brook Street. Um, you took over in 91, Michelle. And then in 74, before then, it, it had its work, first Michelin star. 77, its second Michelin star and 82, it's third Michelin star. So, you know, for you as a young man to come into mm. that pressure to take over <coughs> must have been phenomenal, I would imagine. Oh, ma massive, yeah. yeah. You know, the, uh, the, the pressure, and, and I, mean, I was working at the Gavroche mid-80s already. Um, I mean, I got roped into it. I was working, I was working in the other restaurants uh, mm. in, the, uh, in the group, in the, the brasseries in... Um, oh, that's a cute picture, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
That's, uh, yes, I was working in the brasserie and uh, various places in the city of London as head chef or sous chefs. Uh, and then Dad, I remember one, it was, was mid-80s, he, he phoned up uh, and said, the pastry chef at Gavroche has gone on holiday, uh, or going on holiday, can you come in and fill in? Mm. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. I'll rearrange the rota where I was working and did the two weeks and then... He went on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so Dad said, oh, well, you, know, you can fill in for Steve, and that was it. I was, I was, <laughs> he, yeah. He'd got me, he'd caught me. So, yeah. um, and, and that was it. Shortly after that, Steve went off to do something else, and, or group oh, exec. Group executive. Chef, yeah. Group executive. And you came, you yeah. came up, yeah. And then I came back, yeah. So, um, yeah, he'd, he'd snared me. Mm. But um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I always wanted, oh, no, that's wrong. I didn't always think that, I would take over yeah. from my father, but it seemed like a an inevitable route <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Um, but it was it was incredibly difficult. I mean, very very high pressure, obviously, big big pressure to take over from, you know, the old man uh, and that huge reputation that Gavroche had already, mm. the iconic name, um, and then me wanting to change a few things, uh, and uh, and the old man saying that he'd retired. But he never really <laughs> retired. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> straight away, you, you, yeah, you know. He He's just. Clever. But it was very difficult for him as well to let go. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. This is, it was in his blood. Yeah. Absolutely. So you worked predominantly with Albert Stephen, didn't you? I did. Yes. And um, how was that then? Um, We're jumping a bit around. No, no, no. no it's great. It's great. <laughs> yeah. I, I joined Gavroche in September '78. I started at the Savoy when I was 18 in um, September '76, and I was at the Savoy, which was a great training ground. Mm. But I knew I, after about a year, I thought, mm, it's not quite custom it for me. And I was at Ealing College, which is now Thames Valley University. Yeah. And there was a lad, I was in what was level three in those days, and uh, an advanced catering course. And I met a lad, a Kiwi, who was working at the waterside. And I said, no. So tell me about the Rue Brothers. And he said, what? <laughs> so he told me all about the Rue Brothers and get waterside in. And I said, well, how do I get a, how do I get a job? I said, just write. So I did. Mm. I wrote, couldn't <laughs> believe it. And I met your dad at Wandsworth Road. And um, I walked in the office, got the train, Wandsworth Road, which is salubrious then. <laughs> yeah. M Mugger's Mile, it's called. <laughs> anyway, I walked in the office, and uh, there's this, this, this man there, and a, um, a grey, black, um, polar knit jumper, grey corduroys and clog. They said, uh, oh, that's right now. I've come to, I've come to see Mr. Rue. I've got an interview with Mr. Rue. So, yeah, Mr. Rue will see you in a bit. So, then his secretary came out, I um, can't remember her name, who was with him for years. I said, oh, I believe you come to see Mr. Rue. I said, yes. And I walked in the office, of course, that was Albert. Yeah. And I was in the office, so he comes in and said, you know, it seemed nice to meet you, Bob. I said, um, why do you want to come and work at Gavroche? I said, I want to learn how to cook. He said, fine, you start in September. So I <laughs> <laughs> so I walked out of the... Uh, that was it. Yeah, that's your job. Caroline Brooks. That Caroline was Brooks, yeah. So when I got home to my flat in, in, in <laughs> South Kensington, mm. I rang her up and said, I did get the job, didn't I? She goes, yes, you did. <laughs> and that, that, was, that, was, that was the start of it. I couldn't believe it. And um, when I started at Gavroche in September 78, I thought I'd, I thought I'd made a mistake because Albert wasn't there. I thought, oh, no, it's not one of these restaurants where... The chef patron isn't there. Mm. Oh no! And Jean Louis was there. Jean Louis Tiger. Mm. <laughs> Jean Louis. Who remembers Jean Louis? So I remember Jean Louis. Let, let's him. He was nuts. Right. Okay. And at that, at that, at that time. Careful what you say, Steve. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he was a, he was a, he was a lovely man. He was, yeah. And he looked. <laughs> <laughs> He's braiding back now, isn't he? Jean, Jean Louis. He looked after me. I, it was hard work when I came. Mm. To, I mean, I was, I yeah. was. Well trained at Savoy. Yeah. Walked into Gavosh, oh, bloody hell. Mm. And, um, and I said to jean I said, what's going on? And I said, oh, don't worry, Chef Alibert is coming back in, in a month because in those days, your uncle and father used to swap between Waterside uh, yeah. and yeah, Gavosh. Yeah, of course, because they were yeah, five years between them. Over and then yeah. in um, 78, they decided that was it. Mm. Alibert was coming back to Gavosh full stop. Yeah. And your uncle, mm. your dad, um, Michel, was going back to Waterside and that's the way it was. So Albert turns up in second week of September. Boom, that was it. Yeah. And Albert literally taught me how to cook at the mm. Gavosh. He was on the stove. Mm. It, was un it was unbelievable. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the work, the, the man's work ethic was unbelievable. Mm. And all that, and all that, I got good. I think I wrote in one of the books 
I got good, but I could never keep up with your dad. Mm. I could never <laughs> keep up with your dad. His, his, his speed, his effort, it was incredible. And he, he, he taught me how to cook the gavroche away. And that was the start. But it was amazing. It was, it was, it was a fantastic experience. Yeah. But it was very hard work. Um, I think the first six months, well, we, we were there. Mm. And uh, before you went off to Chappelle's yeah. in January of uh, eight, 80. 80. 80, yeah. And we knew, we knew how tough it was. Mm. And um, that was the hardest six months I've ever done in my life, mm. was in those early days at Gavroche. Not, 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 not brutal, but just really hard. And when your dad was setting new standards, he was pushing for three stars. Yeah. But he knew we'd never get three stars at, 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 at Slow Stones. Yeah. We knew yeah. that. But, so they moved aside. Then, then, we moved, then we moved to Gavroche. In that, F, I mean, I have fond memories of uh, Albert in, in the Rue Scholarship. I fortunately, unfortunately never worked at the Gavroche. And um, I always remember it was one year and that you'd, you and your brother had set one of your ridiculously hard <laughs> competitions. That, and it was a chateau's uh, Ooh, which yeah. you lined with carrot and courgette and then you had to have sweetbread in it, pigeon in mm, there and everything. Right. Yes, I mean, when <laughs> your brother, uh, your f uncle and your father did it, it was wonderful. When some of those competitors did yeah. it, it wasn't so great. <laughs> but what amazed me was that he didn't need to. It was, you talk about the skill of Albert, which you all three have. He, he, he didn't even need to taste something. He just walked up and went... No, it's not good. It's not good. It's not good. It's not good. He, you know, he didn't need to taste it. He knew straight away that that's not right, and that was it. So, did you have time with your grandfather in the kitchen? I did. A I bit. mean, not I much did. Much. Not, yeah, well, from, not as much as you, but yeah. <laughs> no, he 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 would he, he would always be in the kitchen. Always. I mean, he'd always have a sauce. There'd always be butter oh, somewhere God. bubbling. <laughs> Always. Oh, yes. Always. Like, whatever we were I mean, having. Even, even at home or Christmas, yeah. 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 He'd, he'd, yeah. Oh, wow. he'd yeah. always be next to the stove and mm. something would be bubbling away. And I remember one yeah. year at Christmas where he was, he was less um, able to stand on his feet or whatever. Mm. And he'd just say, yeah, pass, bring me the, it over. pass me the sprouts or the potatoes or yeah. something. Give me something to do. I mean, yeah. he wanted to. He couldn't stop. Yeah. 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 And I suppose that's where the influence of the Gavroche came from. It was your father, obviously, and Chef Michel. And I think that legacy of chefs that came through, you know, the bra I always look, looking at this, I thought, one, it was brave how they just suddenly thought, I'm going to open a restaurant. Because <laughs> we knew Albert, he'd trained as a priest, didn't want to do that, decided that wasn't for him, then started working in different households, and then they came up, we're going to open the Gavroche. And then to, in, in the late 60s, have that inspiration, because we weren't a culinary heaven then. You know, it was starting. It was, a it was starting. You know, Elizabeth David was writing. You had Franco down at the Walnut Tree. You had, you know, a lot of chefs come through. But they started it. And what, what gave them that inspiration? Why do you think? I, I always think that Dad was a canny businessman and he saw a, a huge market, <laughs> a huge gap in the market there. Um, but, it, but it was it was definitely a risk. Yeah. You know, a massive risk. Uh, but Dad was a risk taker. Uh, and he, he loved, well, he, he lived, lived on credit, whereas uncle was, was very much the... Keep it in the business, keep, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they worked really well together yeah. uh, as a team, uh, although they were, there were epic arguments between them. Oh, I'm but, sure. But massive love between them as well, as, as very often between brothers. And, um, but no, I, I, think, I think Dad really, well, he loved Great Britain, the UK. Yeah. And made it his home and he was very proud to finally get his British passport <laughs> mm. um, and uh, but but he wanted to to do this he, yeah he never ever really wanted to open a restaurant in France mm. but, and that yeah and that I think is the biggest thing now if you look at the UK now especially London it feels like their influence has just started this French sort of renaissance, I feel, you know. If you look at, you know, you've got Bouchard Racine, you've got Josephine, you've got Frederick, you've got, I mean, everywhere is opening now, and it's, it's this French renaissance has come back. Do you feel a pressure to carry on the legacy of following the traditions of French cuisine? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, yeah, yes and no. Yeah. Y yes and no. Because um, Diego's Italian. Diego's Italian. Yeah. Um, but I feel like Italian has a lot of similarities yeah. with French. It's very home, it's very family, yeah. um, and you know, s simple produce, well executed. Mm. So there's a lot of similarities in that. Um, but Diego also worked for um, Alain Ducasse for more than 10 years, so right. he's also very French. 
yes. the clean train. <laughs> so, um, yeah. You see that, yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit of the influence. Yes. Um, I'm just going to read you a quick quote, actually, and then I want to talk about some of your... Um, fellow um, chefs that worked for you. Or, and this was when um, the Gav... Well, first question, this is when the Gavroche closed, or you announced it was closing last mm. August, Chef. And this is from Phil Howard, and he said, the Gavroche and the Waterside are the pinnacles of excellence. Albert, Michel, Allen, and of course, Michel Junior, Junior are responsible for setting in motion a level of hospitality, discipline, and work ethic that have spawned generations of chefs that have gone on to help make London and the UK one of the most fertile culinary landscapes in the world. Which I think, I mean, he goes on, I mean, it's a phenomenal quote. And the press, after you announced it closed, never mind social media, was everywhere. Did you sort of wake up the next day and go, ooh, should I have done this? Because <laughs> 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 maybe did I think, oh, rashly after that second glass of wine I shouldn't have had. <laughs> no. No, um, it's good. It, 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 was, <laughs> it, it, it was a while in the planning obviously yeah. you can't you, well you, you can just do things on the spur of the moment but it but it certainly wasn't for me mm. uh, the most important part for me was to do it in the right way yeah uh, and to, to be in total control of the decision not many people get that chance actually yeah. to to uh to close their own business uh, in in the right way um i mean you hear horror stories of people closing their business and just messaging or emailing their staff on the on the Sunday or whatever, don't come in on a Monday, and that, mm. that's just not the way I, I could do it. Uh, and it was very important for me to make sure that every person that worked for me had enough notice uh, and that we could work together to the end. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and they all did. Uh, every single member of the team, uh, when I announced in, uh, in August, mm. they all said, we'll work to the very last day, which was mm. fabulous. And... Uh, uh, and that last week was was wonderful because we had events, yep. uh, giving back to charity and some sp uh, some suppliers and things like that, um, and um, and it was just great for Le Gavroche to finish in that manner. Yeah, well, I've got to quote one more quote actually um, from a uh, I think he's here tonight, Adam, Adam Byatt, who I know has, mm -hmm. you've, he's cooked for you many years, and he said, being at the Gavroche for the final supper, knowing that is that is this is where it all be, began. I felt many emotions. The feeling that I have carried over from that night is a sense of responsibility to cook. Never feel tempted to over-modernise and to serve classically authentic dishes with pride. And, I, and I, that, for me, I felt really summed up where the Gavroche is, has been. It sort of gave me goose pimples. Right? And it felt that we all have that responsibility yeah. to carry on like that, I felt, you know. Yeah, I 100% agree, and uh, I, th I think you know part of the responsibility of, of chefs is to pass on their knowledge, yeah, uh, and to encourage and inspire the next generation. Uh, a lot of young chefs don't don't realise that or don't appreciate that. Yeah, uh, I say young chefs, but even some of the older ones. But it, <laughs> it, you know, I think it is our responsibility to uh, teach, pass on our knowledge to the next generation. And there may be another little Gavroche generation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No pressure. Yeah. I'm but it, I mean, if yeah. I mean, the little Julian, who's only four, I tell you, he's, he's, he loves his food and he knows what he's eating. And yeah. I, I would not be surprised <laughs> if, if he is. You heard it here. Yeah, first. I would not. Yeah, yeah, if, I, yeah if I were a betting man, which I'm not, I'd go down to the bookmakers and put a fiver <laughs> yeah. on it, I tell yeah. you. <laughs> um, we'd like to talk about. Um, British versus French food, and I'd like to hear from your father before we do that. So if, if we could mm. play the second clip, please. <laughs> I think the difference between f the French cooking and the English cooking, English cooking was built up for survival. The French cooking was built up for pleasure and gluttony, and you know. And most of the English repertoire is of a substantial food so that it lasts you for the day, <laughs> for the cold weather, and for the hard work <laughs> who lies ahead of you. So it's very, very different. Any of the recipe of the English repertoire is substantial, <laughs> nourishing, you know. Make me laugh. 
as, as a result, 12 hour voice and Madeleine's French one. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, wow. Um, Ooh, they look nice. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> How do you feel about that quote, Steve, and what he says about British and French food, from where you started and how you feel it's changed now? Um, well, it's interesting because when I, when I started at Gavroche uh, all those years ago, I couldn't understand why Albert was giving some of the French cooks such a hard time. Mm. And he said to me, and my, my, my French was getting quite good in those days, and he said to this French boy, he gave me one of his French boys a massive bollocking. And he said to him, just because you've got, you, just because you're French, you don't think you can cook better than the English boys. Yeah. Whoa. Hang on a minute, what's going on here? Yeah. And Albert was a champion of British chefs, even those mm. early days, way before we launched the Boo Scholarship, which yeah. is another amazing, amazing, amazing legacy. I mean, I'm, 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 a, I'm a Francophile, and I love France still, I love the French people, the cuisine, and all that stuff goes with it. Um, it's just it's part, part of me. Um, I need to get back to France for a, for a dose of that. Mm. Um, but the... In, you know, when, when we come to start the conversation, um, in, England was a desert. Mm. The, the, yeah. the, culinary, the culinary scene was basically all the, all the hotels. And if, when I started work at the Savoy, you could have gone to Claridge's, the Dorchester, the Savoy, the Connaught, and the menu would have been the same. Yeah. So it would have been <laughs> Sol Valesca, Sol Veronique, Tondero Rossini, um, all that kind of stuff. And it, honestly, God, they were just mirror images. Yeah. And it was, it, was, it was all about style over substance. The chefs hardly pasted anything up. It was all on silver plates. So mm. now and again, you might get the odd dish from the patisserie, which would have been like an oeuf à or something. Mm. But it was all about, you know, the show out front, yeah. uh, which which was fine. And um, they Albert always, always respected English cuisine. And when he was at um, at um, Fairlawn, as you quite rightly said, he was there was this wonderful lady they called Mrs. Bradbrook. Mm. Some of the recipes that Albert had for the Christmas pudding, etc. Honest to God, Angela, they were absolutely his recipe for Christmas pudding is still the best I've ever tasted. Wow! And Albert championed those British classics. He yeah. loved them. Toad, toad in the hole, and all this. <laughs> no, honest to God, that was, oh, that was one of his favourite yeah. dishes. Yeah. But they had to be. He wasn't talking about English cuisine done badly. Yeah. He was talking about English food done Don't really well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for example, if you gone, if you went to, for example, Simpson's Chop House was next to the Savoy. Yeah. I mean, some of the meats they were cooking in yeah. that, you know, the saddles of lamb for lunchtime sure. was absolutely superb. That was English cookery done well. Mm. Um, and do you feel the cuisine over the years changed at the Gavros? It must have, obviously, when you came and took it over in the image. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 I mean, there was still a lot of butter. I remember to being oh, there oh, one oh. day. <laughs> and you have these rails near the stove where you have your salt, your pepper... Yes. You know, your spoons, and then a, literally like this as butter. And I went, Rachel, and she went, yeah, they're everywhere. You know? <laughs> I mean, we yeah. we yeah. still used a lot of butter. I mean, funny yeah. enough, just before we closed, we had <coughs> Claude Bossy uh, came in with uh, with one of his chefs in for mm. the dinner. And, and Claude loves his, yeah. loves his fat. I mean, he's yeah. Leon, he loves cream and butter. And he walked around the kitchen and he took pictures of the <laughs> mountains of butter. butter. <laughs> yeah. and, he, and he was going, look, look yeah. at the... Look, no wonder the food is good. There's all this butter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, just going back to the British cuisine and Christmas puddings, just a very, very short anecdote. I mean, um, going back a long time now, this was early 80s, uh, early 90s, sorry. And um, we were making a big batch of Christmas puddings with Mark Prescott, another English chef mm. who was running Le Gavroche Kitchen. And um, uh, so we were making, we cleaned down, it was Saturday night, cleaned down the kitchen and we got all the ingredients out for the Christmas pudding and washed the sinks, big sinks, because we were going to make it in the sinks. And that particular week we had a very, very young Richard Corrigan oh. as a stagiaire. Oh, wow. Uh, a work experience. He'd knocked on the door and said, uh, well, I won't tell you exactly what he said, but <laughs> is where Richard, Richard is, yeah, a yeah. very, very... Vocal. But yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> And he just basically said he wanted to spend yeah. a week at, yeah. at the Gavroche. So I said, yeah, no, come in. And he did a week. And uh, we said goodbye, and he was getting changed. He was in the changing room. And he just came back again, because I think he'd forgotten his knives, and he saw myself and Mark Prescott weighing out the ingredients for the Christmas pudding. Mm. And he looked at us, and he went, I'm not effing missing this. <laughs> <laughs> and he got, went straight back in the changing room, got changed, and he gave yeah. his hand to do the Christmas puddings. Um, but it, yeah, the Christmas pudding recipe. I'm on the, the chutney recipes. Yeah, I've still got. Yeah. Really, really, really amazing. Epic. Have they been handed down? 
one home. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're not keen on Christmas pudding. No, but <laughs> I, I know how to make them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and what have you taken, do you feel, in your restaurant that you've taken from the Gavroche, or your father mainly, I suppose? Well, so much, and yeah. not just cooking techniques, you of know? Course. I mean, so many times have I rang and said, okay, right, what am I, you know, what am I supposed to say to my landlord today? Yeah. <laughs> Especially going through COVID, there's been situations oh, where I'm thinking, right, help me out here. Like, yeah. what, what would you do in my shoes? Or has this happened to you before? Mm. There's been so, m I mean, yeah, lots of calls <coughs> and conversations on, you know, how to Not when it comes to, to cooking, navigate. though, because... Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's a few calls sometimes. Uh, well. Do you not say, Dad, try this? Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. And if he sort of gives feedback, how's that taken? So I, <laughs> 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 I, I take, I take, you take his it. His feedback yeah. is, is, is precious. Of course, yeah. <laughs> I would, I, I would You're saying the right things there, yes. Emily. <laughs> still getting those recipes. <laughs> yeah, keep that. No, but I think out of any... But in a way, there's probably a fear as much as anything. Not a, a bad fear, but you want to make sure your father of course. likes it. Of course. And then you want to know that he will. And then if there's feedback, you know... No, I mean... I, I think we cook pretty well. Yeah. So there's never been there's never been a moment where you said, Oh god, this is, you know, super mm. under seasoned or super over seasoned no. or super undercooked or super overcooked. I think we're, we're not too bad chefs, you know. <laughs> so, so you know what you're doing. You've done it. Kind yeah. of. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 more yeah, it's yeah, more but your about style, I mean the, the style of the Gavros has mm. changed. I mean, you would remember the style in the eighties and then you know, the nineties and you changed the thousands. I changed mm. a bit as well, made it a bit lighter and slightly different uh, mm. approach to cuisine as well. But then when you look when you look back when Emily looks back at what I was doing, or what I'm still doing, she said, Oh, you're a dinosaur dad. Mm. You know, uh, but but then you've still got French classic cuisine training. Yeah. Uh, yeah but, but, but it's the next well. generation. Yeah, but a good sauce is a good sauce. Oh, you know, good. you can't... But I think that's exactly what you said, and it sort of brings us on to a point of the, the legacy and that training. And I spoke to a few chefs. I spoke to Bryn Williams. I called him mm -hmm. up, you know, as I said, Adam Bias. I spoke to Marcus, and I said to them, you know, what, what is it about the Gavroche that made you, one, want to go there, and two, what did you learn? And Bryn came back with some great comments, you know. <laughs> And he talked about, he said, you know, he wanted to go there because he was driven by pastry and they'd done a, a programme on pastry, um, Michelle and um, Alain, uh, not Alain, uh, Michelle and Albert. And he, that's what it got him through the door. But then he was loved the cooking side of it. And he said there were two things that he said, never throw a butter paper away mm -hmm. because you can use a butter paper for so many things. And he said, you never put enough red wine in a red wine sauce for Albert. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and it just made me chuckle because I thought, yes, I can absolutely believe that that's probably exactly yeah. as it was there. No. Yeah, I mean, butter papers, yeah. I mean, yeah well, chefs yeah. throwing them in that the bin. Your, that was your dad. I mean, for yeah. God's sake, it, it's, it's foil yeah. and it's greased. It's ready, ready to use, isn't it? I mean, it, it's, yeah, crazy. Use it the whole time. Yeah. Um, right, we're going to play another clip of your father just before we talk about the legacy of what the, uh, the Gavroche and the, the people. So this is about um, young chefs in the kitchen. <laughs> Yes, you speak, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Leg wash. Mm. Paris. Have we got the third clip, please? Oh, it's gone very quiet. Here we go. Here we go. First and foremost, I need to have a person who has the right attitude towards their work and an, a, a eagerness to succeed. Now, after that, teaching is plain sailing. Marcus Wery, Marco Pierre White, Gordon Ramsay, Pierre Kaufman, Christian Germain of the Chateau de Montreuil, Philippe from the Square. It's so uh, rewarding for me when you pick up a youngster, young girl, young boy who's never touched a saucepan in her life and then you finished up with a star after five or six years. It gives me such an, an happiness. All of them after a year are passing through and they're made for life. They, they will not want a job. You know, they will always find a job. People all over the world, they open that little magic piece of paper, sign, and they say, oh, well, that's a rude boy. It must be good. Right. <laughs> what does that mean to you, Stephen, what's down the 
chef just said. That was wow. great. Massive amount. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he saw something in me, which I, I didn't see. I was a young idiot come from. Well, I had no idea where mm. I might end up. And it was all about um, hard, very, very, very hard work. And with with your dad, you had to you had to keep up. Mm. He was a very he was a very fair man, very understanding, mm. very caring, very compassionate. But you had to do the job. Yeah. And um, as I said earlier on, this thing about the English boys, his lad, uh, bless him, the late Peter Chandler, mm. he was the first English apprentice yeah. who went on to Paris House. Albert, Albert, I love Peter. Possibly because he had a love for the horses as well. Yeah. That was another, <laughs> that's another story he yes. there today. And he did as well. He was a devil. <laughs> and um, again, I mean, all these people that came through, that Ro Ro Roly Lee. Yeah. Yep. I, mean, I mean, that's another great story. Mm. And, and it's Roly Lee turned up at Gavroche. And um, Roly wanted to be a food critic. And he'd been to Cambridge. I was saying to him earlier, I couldn't remember whether he got kicked out of Cambridge or he finished his degree, one or the other. <laughs> but he could write beautifully. Yeah. And um, he got a job at Joe Allen's. And then he realised he wanted to, to go on. So he started to work at the Pulvo. And in those days, the Roos had um, the Gamma near the Old Bailey. Then we had the, the Pulvo, yep. which was on Cheapside. He used to do unbelievable numbers. In those days, lunch in this city was big. You know, in the 70s and 80s, it was massive. Mm. The pool bowl would be packed, lunch and dinner. I'll talk, I'll talk a bit more about pool bowl service afterwards. It was un yeah. unbelievable. Did you do a stretch of the pool bowl? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Scarred me for life. Oh, my God. <laughs> remind, remind me to tell you about the pool bowl service. I don't want to detract too much yeah, from that, cool. but unbelievable place. Mm. And um, uh, so Rowley, Rowley went to the pool bowl. And the first week Rowley was there, my dad was there. Mm. And... Roly, Roly, Ro he, didn't, he didn't have a good couple of days. And Albert <laughs> said to him, that's it, you're gone, you're fired. So Roly said to, 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 to your dad, so, please, Mr. Roo, chef, can I please have a word with you? So he goes, yeah, sit down. He said, um, what is it? He said, I came to the pool bow, never saying I could cook. I came to the pool bow to say I wanted to learn how to cook. So your dad said, you start at Gavroche on Monday. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I was in the kitchen, and Al, uh, Roly called me his minder for years. And Roly turned up, and he walked down the stairs of the Gavroche that we talked about before, yeah. and all the smells and the heat and everything else. And he walks down the stairs in his army greatcoat, walks to the end of the kitchen, which was about as long as this stage. Mm -hmm. And there was a, there was a, a vent where the storeroom was and change room, God knows what else. He walks to the end of the kitchen, comes back in. I knew who he was, and he goes... Where's the rest of it? I guess, Rowley, this, this, this is it. <laughs> and I said, where's the change room? I said, you just, you just walked out of it. Yeah. So <laughs> Rowley started, and Rowley, as you know, went on to become this amazing success. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Incredible. He won restaurant of the year mm. at Pullamo. Yeah. He went back as head chef. And then, of course, they opened the iconic Kensington mm. Place. Yeah. And there's another great success story of, you know, mm. this young, well, it wasn't young, but young, a bit older than me, yeah. English chef, you bugger all, and Albert turned him well, mm. turned him into this incredible success in London. So that 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 thing we just talked about, yeah, it resonates with me to this day. And, and when I'm still cooking, I imagine he's still looking over, thing. You wouldn't do that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all it's all it's always there, not in a bad way, in a in a yeah. lovely way. That is that what Albert would do, you know? Like, yeah. It's still with me. Put a bit more nice. butter in it. <laughs> <laughs> But Absolutely. it is that. I said to a young chef that works with me, I said, what, what does the get word Gavroche mean to you? What is the restaurant? And he said, well, it's, it's where all the dons went, isn't it? It's where they all it's went. What, sorry? All the oh, doms, right, okay. you know, all the geezers in a way. Because they, you know, and he sort of, you know, he said, you look where Marco went and Gordon went and Mark. And then you see the legacy of where all those chefs, people have worked for them, who are now owning restaurants like myself. And that's the legacy I feel that will carry on forever. You oh, know, God, absolutely. How we all put scallops on a tray. How we all put, you know, <laughs> red mullet on a tray. How you prep this is—it all leads from Albert, and you know, and that's why I think it's incredible about it. Not we bit. have um, an extra chef, oh, yeah, a lo on. little clip that I'd like oh, to yes. play you as well, and just to get your thoughts on this one. <laughs> if you can play the fourth <laughs> clip, please. Go on. Oh God, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. Is it? Okay. Mm. 
Oh. oh. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing interview. Um, with all the rude dynasty, uh, Michelle taught me how to get organised. Uh, beyond belief, but more importantly, his butchery skills were incredible. Also, he just had that level of calmness in service, a bit like me in the early days. Um, and it was amazing how he'd flip into French uh, one moment, then sort of sound like a cockney um, in the other moment, but uh, cool, calm, composed. Um, I remember Emily um, being born. Yeah, that's right. I just got back from uh, Paris, and I remember seeing this gorgeous three-year-old girl, uh, and so happy for Giselle and Michelle. Um, Stephen Doherty, Bulldog. Yeah, he taught me that you can have a face um, like a English Bulldog tuna wasp and still be a phenomenal chef. Uh, one of the grumpiest, one of the most uh, fierce, uh, one of the most angry motherfuckers on the planet. When Bulldog walked into the kitchen, trust me, you shat yourself. Um, but again, um, that guy taught me how to make a perfect souffle suissesse. And behind the veneer, behind the bulldog face, he's an absolute a giant teddy bear. Um, so, yeah, extraordinary. Albert was just handing over the reins to Michelle um, back in the early 90s uh, when I stepped in. So Albert, I would bump into every morning about 4.30 when I was baking. The bakery side, especially the, uh, uh, the bread uh, and all the... Uh, incredible sorbets, Albert and I would have multiple chats every morning for about half an hour. So I hope that helps. Uh, miss you uh, loads. Love you. And uh, let's do dinner soon, girl. Um, and make sure um, you send this video to Bulldog because uh, <laughs> fuck me, don't miss that guy. <laughs> Everybody knows your nickname now, eh? Yeah, it's all out there, it's all out there. Try to keep it quiet, sure. Yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. how do you feel seeing people like Gordon, like Steve, Terry, like Mark? They've all gone on now. You know, mm. Monica, you know, Rachel, you know, the phenomenal legacy. Well, Rachel's that, still with us. Well, no, yeah, I know what you mean, but, you know, they, how well they've all done. I mean, that must feel it, something. It is, it is really, really wonderful and mm. uh, pinch me moments, but... Um, but the, the, when, uh, when uh, Gordon was uh, a young commie chef at Gavroche, we had Gordon, we had uh, uh, Stephen Terry, Marcus Waring, um, Roger Pisey. Oh, Pisey, um, yeah. You know, I mean, what, a, what a team, and plus all the others. I mean, it was mm. an incredible brigade at that time. Yeah. And what I do find astounding is how, how it attracted, and I may get shot down for saying this, um, I know Gordon's background was not a foodie background. Mm. Marcus's was not a foodie background, but there was something about the Gavroche that they all knocked on that door and they wanted to work there. And whether it's because they they knew what Pierre was now doing, what Nicola Dennis was doing, but it made them all want to go into that kitchen, which, you know, these days everyone's on Instagram and shows, you know, but there was none of that. It was just tap on the door, write a letter, and you got through if you were lucky. It was, it was a different era. Yeah, mm. different era. I mean, nowadays you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's... Um, you hire through uh, agencies and mm. no longer do you know young chefs or front of house knock on the door and say are you looking for a job yeah um, or have you got a job vacancy I should say so it's it, it is it is a totally different world and um, but you know, that's good it's progress and it's changed it's, yeah, it's, it's changed, changed for massive yeah changes. and changed for the better in some respects absolutely yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely and how do you feel about seeing you know all these people that have gone through that kitchen you you've got it coming through yours now Emily yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I think it's amazing. I think, you know, as you said, when you see all of these amazing chefs today, you, you respect, you know, total mm. respect to grandfather, father, um, for creating these amazing chefs and building them um, to have amazing careers, I think. But as you said earlier, that's also sort of our duty, you know, yep. as, mm. as, as owners and chef patrons, mm. um, to help any youngsters through their career and build build their own path. Mm. Yeah. And I think, I think that's where the Rue dynasty legacy will carry on, in the sense, and not to say it's the pressure of putting it through you, Emily, but I think with the Rue scholarship that's now 40 years old, and I think when I read about when, you know, and you'd announced, I thought, oh. And the one thing that I felt, not a, a, a sadness, if I'm honest, because when people always say to me, oh, what would you recommend? My son, my daughter, they want to go into cooking. What do you think they should do? And every time I always answer, go to a kitchen like the Gavroche. Mm. 
because, you know, you learn everything. You will learn how to bake bread. You will learn how to make an ice cream. You will learn how to make a cheese souffle, a proper sauce. And, it, and it's those foundations, even though all the chef's names here have done lots of different restaurants, it's the foundations of what I think they've learned at the Gavroche yeah, that is the absolutely. influence throughout this country. And I don't think we can ever take that for granted. I think that's, you know, how you make a sauce. I know how I make a venison sauce is probably the same as you because I got taught by Marcus. Yeah, well, there you and go. he would have been taught by you and yeah. the lemon tart that's gone through the country. We're all stuck on names. <laughs> Trust me, it was his father and uncle. It was no one else, you know. Oh, yeah, I, I, first time I tasted that lemon tart was when I was doing the washing up at the Waterside Inn over yeah. a summer holiday to earn enough money to buy myself a racing bike. Uh, I was probably 14, I think, at the time. 14, maybe 15. And, um, yeah, that lemon tart that uncle created. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's... It went everywhere, didn't it? Yeah, I remember when, 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 when your dad came back from Waterside, he had this recipe, and I think it must have it got it convoluted, and we, and we made it. You, you would have been there. And I, your dad's going, that's not right, that's not right. I said, mm. tell the chef, that's the recipe you gave him. said, leave it with me, leave it with me. So the next day, he came back with this other recipe, and that was it. That it and that's how the lemon tart started. Yeah. September, October, 78, at Gavosh, and it's all over Beautiful. the world. It really is all everywhere. Yeah, it's been on Marano since it's the open. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been telling everyone it's mine, but I know for a fact it's not. <laughs> no, but this is what I always laugh about. I think recipes are, you know, I know I got that recipe from Gordon, who without doubt got it from Marco, who no, we know stole it from the Gavroche. Absolutely. So, you know, it's yeah. how well, everything, blessing, yeah. and that's yeah. where it all happens. Yeah. Um, what's next for you, Michelle? Oh, gosh, uh, a lot. I'm very, very busy, uh, thankfully, which is good. Uh, maybe a little bit too busy, but uh, I mean, yeah, loads. I've got a yeah. free day. I mean, with uh, do you want me to list them? Yeah, I mean, no, no. <laughs> I'm just you know, just curious. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I'm about to go filming another series of uh, Rue Down the River, uh, and uh, which, which I really enjoy. I pick and choose the TV I do mm. now, which which is which is good. I'm in a good position that way. Um, and uh, gosh, I'm on the Queen Mary, the Queen Anne. But you you do the TV very well. You know, oh, well, that's great. No, you, you, so you. Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> no, but I think, you, you know, it doesn't always come naturally to everyone. But I think, you, you know, you formed your how you want to be. And you, oh, I feel you're yourself. Well, it's exactly I, I, that. Yeah. 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 Uh, I feel at ease when I'm doing what I normally do and, mm. and being myself. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a good actor. Yeah. yeah. Any shifts down at Emily's restaurant, maybe? No? Yeah. 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 Sure. Oh, right. Sure. Excellent. Yeah. Star yeah, appearance. We're going to be doing an event uh, next week. Yeah, 15th of May. 15th of May, a, a wine wine event where I'm hosting as well. So, yeah, we're doing lots of events actually mm. together, which is really good. So get on the newsletter. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and yeah, uh, next, uh, again, it's got a couple of tables free, I think. Mm. Yep. Yeah, there is. There is. Yeah. Well, you, you, there's also Father's Day. We're going to oh, yeah, do, oh, you know, do we, there's lots yeah, of there's things. There's lots. Okay. I'm keeping him busy. Keeping him busy. Yeah. 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 That and babysitting, of course. That and babysitting. Oh, yes. That's all right. <laughs> um, and Stephen, you, after you left the Gavroche, you went on to obviously do many other things. Are you still working with that eth not ethos behind you, but still working as, as hard as you no, were? No, I'm not. I mean, this 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 year I was talking to a gentleman before, and this year was the kind of year I was trying to take a bit of a step back, mm. get myself back in the gym and the rest of it. But you always end up being busy. You always got a little niggle at, at the back of Albert. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you should be doing something. So I am I am still keeping busy. I did quite a bit of work with Kenwell College. Mm. Um, I like working with the students there. I we relaunched the um, Scott, what was called the Young Harvest Chef, and again another legacy of your dad. Mm. Um, Albert loved Scotland. He was in yeah. love with Scotland. Um, the produce, the people. I mean, some of the some of the produce. Albert called Scotland the Lard of Europe. Mm. And some I was right. I was in, I was up there a few weeks ago. I was in the kitchen of um, restaurant Andrew Fairley yeah. with Stevie, and spent an afternoon with him. And the scallops turned up from the island mull. Oh my God, Angela! They were the shells were this big. They never send them down here. Just the the scallops. Keep, keep them up there. Yeah. And yeah. We the, 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 the scallop meat inside was huge, just gorgeous stuff. Yeah. And um, so you know the, the the love of that kind of thing doesn't go away. And then um, so we did that. I'm doing a dinner at Perth College on Tuesday for the Scottish. Uh, we renamed it the Scottish Harvest yeah. Chef. And the reason Albert did that was again to create a legacy. He felt that he wanted to give something back to Scotland, so he launched that in 20, 2010, was it? Mm. Yeah, Some, it was somewhere early around 2000s, there. Yeah. So yeah. all the Rue 
uh, alumni used to go up there and spend a couple of days with them. God, some of the stuff and, we did. Just oh my God. We Sorry. are going to open it up to the audience, but I just could you just tell everyone who does? Because maybe not people know the Ruth Scholarship, how oh, yeah. it started, what it means, and yeah, so it's founded 40 years ago. Um, father and uncle wanted to um, have a competition that would give back to the uh, English chefs, or when they say give back, I mean, um, give them an opportunity. Which, remarkable, given that Gavroche was only probably then not like 15 years old. They'd already had that in their head. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, from day one. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. From day one, the idea was to get as many English chefs and front of house, let's not forget, yeah. uh, working for them and to pass on, you know, pass that enthusiasm and knowledge on to get more and more uh, Brits into, uh, into the hospitality industry uh, but yeah so, so formally that was a competition for professional chefs and the uh, the the winning uh, the winner would get a prize to go and work all expenses paid three months in any Michelin three-star restaurant of their choice mm. um, so seeing as at the time 40 years ago there were no three Michelin star restaurants in the UK it was mm. a huge huge Tough. incentive yeah massive incentive and the first winner was Andrew Fairley yeah, yeah. absolutely uh, yeah. 40 years ago sadly no longer with us yes um, and I think he, he went to Eugénie Les Prés I think yeah. uh, he went to Michel Gare Eugénie Les Prés yeah. that's right yes. and, mm. uh, and was offered a job I yeah. think, yeah, I think oh. he stayed on there for a year and uh, then came back uh, but um, it, it it's carried on obviously father and uncle are no longer here to to uh, to sort of steer the ship, but um, myself and uh, Anna are yeah. in charge now, and um, now make it extra hard. We, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're making it very very hard. <laughs> <laughs> but it is incredible that when you look at all the winners, uh, what mm. they've done uh, and w what they've achieved. It's yeah, incredible. no, I think it's an amazing. It is amazing. I think it, I, I've always felt it an honour to uh, judge it. Even though sometimes I'm like, what on earth are they asking them to do? This is so out of my room, but it's brilliant. Right, thank you all. That's been incredible. But we are going to open it up to the audience. Um, I think there's going to be people with microphones. Do we have any questions? Oh, yes, yeah, straight up. Oh, straight away. Here, here we go. go. Here we go. <coughs> I'm going to let the lovely people run away. There's a lady there. Excuse me. Thank you. Oh, yes, if you could pass that over. Thank you. Hello. Um... So we've talked a little bit about traditional cooking and classical methods, and I suppose I wanted to know if, as international and globalised food is increasing, like popularity and prominence, whether those techniques and flavours, etc., have had an impact on your individual cooking styles and approach to food. Mm. Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, well, I, I was lucky to work in Hong Kong uh, back in the '80s, so I was fortunate enough to be sort of. To, to see different cooking methods and different ingredients, which I brought back with me, or ideas that I brought back with me. But that's, that, I think that's fabulous, and I think we have to do that. Although, you've got to be very wary as a chef, I think, uh, of, of mixing too many cultures uh, in your cuisine, because um, you know, from, from fusion, it can become very easily confusion. <laughs> uh, and, 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 it's, and it's not nice. At least I don't think it is. So, but, but using it, using it intelligently and well, yeah, fantastic. I mean, but then I remember working at Alain Chapelle in, in, the, in, in 80, 81. Um, and France, diehard, I mean, Lyonnais cuisine. Uh, but he was already, he'd travelled extensively to, uh, to Japan. Mm. And he was already incorporating things like ginger in 1980 in France. Mm. Star anise. It was, and star anise. It was mm. pretty, whoa, pretty far out. But, um, yeah, I think if it's done properly, it can be really, really great. Agreed. Does that influence you, Emily? <laughs> yeah, we... we well, <laughs> you were talking about Japanese. We've, we've just put on the menu a, oh, yeah. um, <coughs> a tuna with, um, with a homemade mandarin ponzu. Oh, so, fabulous. Oh, wow. Yeah, we... Uh, well, we, we, we both love yes. all yeah. types of food, to be honest. But... Um, Again, it's got to be done properly. Yeah. Yeah. Be done. yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you've got an Italian restaurant. You wouldn't put pineapple on your pizza, would you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually left a date when someone did do that. <laughs> <laughs> All the signs were there that it was never going to work. <laughs> um, do we have another question? Oh, lots of questions. Uh, oh, there's a gentleman there, please. Michelle, you pioneered uh, French cuisine in London and... What's your view, though, of, of food in France uh, in this day and age? Oh. Has, has France lost its way, or is it competing with the rest of the world? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Well, London, London definitely now can rub shoulders with any capital city in the world, any gastronomic. I mean, it's a, it's, London is now a gastronomic destination, which is fabulous. Um, but I do, I do agree to a certain extent where France did lose their way. Uh, they lost their way, I think, going back about 20, 30 years now. Um, the 36-hour week certainly didn't help, uh, and uh, corners were cut. Um, but I think things are, are far, far better now than they've ever been. There's a, there's a host of young chefs that have really mm. taken the bull by the horns and are, are doing some fabulous stuff, especially in the big cities. When you go outside of the big cities, it starts getting a little bit difficult, a little bit difficult. Mm. Um, this young lady there. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk tonight. Fantastic. Um, I'd be really interested in knowing, like, what's your one appliance or kitchen gadget in your home kitchen that, as a chef, you can't live without, or maybe. You know, you had something similar in the restaurant and you've kind of scaled it back or found something comparable mm. for home cooking. Mm. Come on, Emily. I haven't got that many gadgets. I mean, I've, I've got my KitchenAid used use yeah. for various stuff. Yeah. I've got the appliance for the pasta. So we, we do pasta a lot with, um, with Julian. Um, I haven't got that many gadgets. What about you, Chef? Yeah. A mandolin. Oh, oh a mandolin, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm all the all the gadgets that are out there. A French mandolin. Yeah, yeah. You still, you can't. There's nothing out there that yeah. will create that thinness. Yeah. On those slices that you get on one of those things, those bad boys, you should take the new fingers off. You know. Yeah. 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 Where the gun? Especially the, Jap the Japanese ones. Oh, oh my God! Just. I can't, I can't even look at one of those, but. <laughs> uh, mine would be a, a, a microplane for the similar reason. Ooh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I yeah. like, a, you know, I zest. A lemon zest on top, yeah. All that sort of stuff, yeah. yeah. Lovely truffle. But actually, I think most people would be surprised how few gadgets yeah. most chefs have in their kitchen. Yeah. You know, we've all done charity dinners at houses, and I go and go, Jesus, this is better than Murano. I mean, some of them have so much stuff, so I'll be surprised. That they never use. They never, yeah. 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 But, I mean, for, well, yeah, for, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm old school. I like a moolie. Oh, yeah, a moolie, yeah. The yeah, potato uh, yeah. or, or one of those, yeah. Fantastic. When, when, when have you used that? <laughs> <laughs> it's all coming out now, <laughs> Chef. Do you, do you know where it is in that? No, I don't. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I use it but when you're not coming for dinner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I make a lovely fish soup and I press oh, yeah. all the heads through it and you yeah. don't like fish soup. Oh, okay. there you go. Okay. okay. No, mooly for me. <laughs> the lady yeah. over in the farm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, when you speak about like young chefs knocking on the door and asking for a job, where would you say? If you were a young chef now, where would you go to do that? Oh, good question. Ooh, yeah. Well, you can't say go to Gavroche anymore. No, you can't. <laughs> uh, go to Cargdale. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, gosh. Uh, I mean, I, I've always advised young chefs to, to do college. I mean, their colleges get a bad rap and, and young chefs, you know, think it's a waste of time. But I think it's important to do college. Yep. Uh, get your qualifications and to, you know, to do that. Um, but if you want to learn French, French classic cuisine, I mean, it's the Ritz. Yeah. Yeah, John's doing a good job. Agreed. It's a yeah. great, great place mm. to do an apprenticeship. Absolutely. Um, and, and he still does, doesn't he? He does he a does. Yeah. yeah, he does a three, three year course, apprenticeship course, and it's brilliant. So, yeah, for me, it would be to learn, to learn the great French classics, at least. It would be some, somewhere like the Ritz, anyway. Yeah, I think in London, the, the five star hotels, they can still afford those great brigades yeah yep. and you know they still make the, the patisserie department for example mm. they'll have a dozen people in there mm. still making you know, exquisite you know, their own pastry their own yeah. most of it they're all they're still great training grounds mm. in mm. london no. if I, someone said to me where should a guard go still london and it was still initially get the college and then one of the five one of the top five stars yeah which are still not well you know you, you know these guys they're knocking out some great stuff yeah no they are i think yeah. the ritz is phenomenal yeah. it really is and he's a great mentor yeah john yeah yeah, yeah. great mentor oh my microphone um next question yes sir um yep you there pink shirt yeah. 
There we go. Probably impossible question to answer. If you could choose one restaurant from the last Gosh. 25 years <laughs> for you to go and have one meal, and it can't be any restaurant run by anybody on the panel, wow. <laughs> which, one, one which one restaurant one. would you choose to go to for your meal? Wow. Can I answer first? Go on. Yeah. <laughs> well, when the name came up before. And before, I was having a chat with Andrew Fairley many years ago because he was judging the, the, uh, the young Han chef thing. And we are talking about great, memorable meals. We both said Michel Gaillard for us mm. was the best place we've ever eaten in those days. I mean, he's an old man. He's 85 now. But mm. when, uh, uh, when Michel Gaillard, did you ever get there? No. Oh, That's my goodness crazy. me. Just yeah. phenomenal. That would be mine without a shadow of a doubt. I think, oh, gosh. So difficult, isn't it? I mean, on that level, I would say, and it, 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 it's someone like Bra, you know, Michel mm. Bra. Okay. You know, another very family-run business, and and actually one of my favourite. I imagine you did the same things as my husband worked there. And when you say about young chefs, sorry, just back to your earlier question, if you can't get into um, these big kitchens, I would always look for a chef who's worked abroad. Mm. I genuinely mm. think a guy who's worked abroad or a girl who's worked abroad. They've got a different edge to them, and I think that really helps your culinary sort of um, knowledge. Anyway, I'm digressing. Um, I would say Bra, I think it's brilliant, you know, and I was very fortunate to be there one time with Neil, and they always did the old school way of the kitchen table when you sat down and had the family, and because we were there, they opened the cellar, and I was like, love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice. And, um, and, I'll never, and then one time we ate with Michelle, and, and I don't know whether you guys have ever done it, but Michelle peels his tomatoes for a tomato salad. <laughs> and I don't speak fluent French, but I know Neil was sitting there going, she don't peel her, sa her tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, non, si pas, je blah, blah, blah. I was like, you bastard, Neil. You know? <laughs> but no, that for me is memories and phenomenal food. Chef? Um, I, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. Oh. I've, it is, it's a very tough yeah. question. Um, I mean, I've, I've eaten some absolutely fantastic places. Um, and, uh, yeah, to, to choose one over the other would be very difficult. Mm. But um, I am going to go for uh, Anna Ducasse in Monaco. Mm. I was going to um, say that. <laughs> I was ah! going to say that. <laughs> Sorry, Emily. One, one, particular, <sighs> one particular meal which was absolutely mm. stunning. Um, it was when they... <laughs> <laughs> Which is where we met, yeah. Yeah, you <laughs> and Diego were working uh, at the time. Um, so we had the best table in the house. Yeah. Just on the terrace opposite the uh, the uh, the casino. Uh, and uh, and we were a, a family table. So mm. myself, my wife, yourself and your husband-to-be. Yeah. Uh, although it was early days then. Very early days, uh, yeah. But, the, uh, but the, the meal was just absolutely mind-blowing. And it was mind-blowing because it was beautifully cooked and it was mm. excellent ingredients, but it was the moment in time. Yeah. Emily, now you've been you Oh, yeah, now you've been <laughs> <laughs> that. Um, I'd say another family dinner, though, where we were all the four of us, was uh, Cellar de Can Rocca, which oh, was... Oh, um, yes. Which is absolutely amazing Barcelona. day. Yeah. Uh, Girona. Um, oh, yeah. We were both working, I think, in Paris, Diego and I. Yeah, you were, yeah. And it was... That was a very good meal. It, it was really... We were, we were sort of really working hard mm. at that point and had very few days off to match and to meet up all together. And I think we met over there. Yes. And we were so tired, but it was just mm. the best, best meal ever. Mm. Yeah, Diego was still, he's still working for Ducasse then. Yeah, he was, that. I think. I can't, I can't remember. Probably, yeah, yeah probably. But your dear, your dear, your dear father, bless him. He, he loved two places in, he loved two places in France. L'Ami Louis. Mm. L'Ami Louis, yes. In Paris, and Brasserie Benoit. Which again, just classic French. Yeah. Which just knockout. Which yeah. Ducasse has taken over, hasn't he? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Still very good, though. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, right, a few more questions. Oh, lots up here. Oh, uh, they're pointing at this chap oh. ahead. <laughs> there. Oh, yeah. We've had wonderful things about the food, but very little about the service. One of the great things about the Foch because you felt so cosseted and so loved. And we've seen pictures of um, the Perberschlager twins. Yes. And Silvano coming through. Yes. Would you care to tell us about how you made, or how you and your father made, Gavros such a wonderful place to, to be seated in as mm, well as to be fed question. in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, great question. very often chefs uh, ignore the front of house, which is, which is criminal because 
Uh, without great service, uh, your food uh, is nothing. Uh, and uh, we've, we've been blessed with well, that. There they are. Yeah. Yes. Hey. <laughs> and so on. <laughs> great. Um, and all three are here today, uh, which, is, which is great. Yeah. So the, um, yeah. yeah. So it is, it is so important, uh, like you say, to, to make your guests feel at ease. Because come, come, coming to eat at a place like Gavroche, Michelin starred, uh, and it, you, you know, some people think it's going to be stuffy, or it, it can be, people come here and they trepidation and nervous, mm. and they're going to spend a lot of money, so they want it to be you know, really you know, nice. And, but I think the front of house team that we've had at the Gavroche make people feel immediately at ease. Uh, and, uh, and, and then it becomes a convivial dining place. Mm. The one thing I hate when I do dine out in these you know, Michelin-starred uh, places that almost feel like you're dining in a morgue, mm. <laughs> and you pay reverence to the place, mm. and you're, when you're talking, you're talking like this because you're afraid to make a noise, <laughs> and that's not fun. Yeah. So Gavroche, I think we got it. Just on this, David as well, mm. uh, and Chef Rachel, who's here also tonight. I mean, it, it's it's about the conviviality and about making people enjoy enjoy themselves. Uh, and I, I think you know you, you do well to highlight that. And definitely, it was something that we we were very proud of, and that was our front of house. Mm. 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 We've got a number, a number of guests here, and a lot of you have dined at Gavroche over the years, and uh, a lot of you are, are nodding in appreciation. Yeah, that it's exactly. Uh, I think you can blame me for the lack of... You, I think, a, have you got a question there, Dennis? Yeah. There's this one thing, man. The Gavroche. A duck burger. Oh, the duck I mean, burger. Nobody... Okay, I've got a story the, about this. Nobody would go into that restaurant and order a burger. Yeah. But me. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, the story is that... <laughs> the story is that I was watching a television show yeah. and this gentleman, who I had the privilege of meeting in the buff, <laughs> in the gym... That's too much, too much information there, Dennis. <laughs> and I said, oh, what's a duck burger? I'm from New York. What's a duck burger? I never heard of a duck burger. And he explained to me the ingredients of this particular burger, which is phenomenal. <laughs> and I watched, because we were talking about being unstuffy in a Michelin star restaurant. Okay. I watched the guests, some guests, not all, look at what was brought to the table when I ordered. They were ordering all of this stuff. I'm drinking champagne. <laughs> and all of a sudden, a duck burger comes out <laughs> with chips <laughs> and duck fat stacked perfectly. Only this gentleman right here cooked it for me. Not on one occasion, not on two occasions, <laughs> but many occasions. And I'm, I'm going to ask Emily, I said, you got to bring that. You got to bring it. You got to, because I will never have that again. I try. Yeah. You got to think about it. I know, I know. It's not, a, I know. But anyway, <laughs> I just had to bring that to the floor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. We have time for a couple more questions, I think. It's a, a lady here. You'll have to excuse me for the lack of... It's not that we dis, uh, lack about the front of house, because I've got three chefs. I did <laughs> kitchen focus it, but it's not because we... I wanted to ask about the significance of the name hmm? Gavroche. Yes. Hmm? Simple word. Yeah, well, Le Gavroche, Victor Hugo, Les Miserables. So the little street urchin, who's our, that's our logo. Um, and uh, dad and uncle thought that it would be a great name because it's so French. Uh, Victor Hugo, you can't get much more French than that. Um, and uh, and I, I think dad once said as well to me that he chose the name because it was incredibly difficult to pronounce, to pronounce <laughs> for the British. So he said a, a, a difficult name would be one that people would remember. <laughs> yeah. Typical Albert. <laughs> yeah, very cantankerous. Yeah. Uh, two more questions then. We've got lady, those two ladies at the top there. Thank you.
Um, first of all, thank you so much for this evening. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Um, what advice do you have for someone that wants to go into the industry, but not necessarily as a chef? So I know, like, Angela, you do a, a podcast, for example. Mm. Michelle, you do a lot of TV, that kind of thing. So, yeah, what advice do you have for someone wanting to pursue the industry, but with no, like, chef qualifications? Ooh. Well, I mean, it depends. Depend, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, hos hospitality <coughs> is huge. Um, and I always say there's a job for everyone in hospitality. But if you include um, food journalism or... Um, podcasts or whatever, I think you still need an understanding of the industry. So mm. you would have to work, uh, even be it short, short term, to get a real taste for it and a real you know, point of view of it. Um, and so therefore, you know, I, I would advise working a bit in the kitchen, a bit of front of the house, uh, and, and just to get that under your belt. Mm. Would you Absolutely. say the same, Stephen? Um, absolutely, mm. yeah, definitely. Even, even a, a spell at a catering college. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, there's some, I mean, especially the ones in London, Westminster, mm. Thames Valley, they're, as we know, they're amazing. Some of the best in the country, if not yeah. the best. Yeah. You know, you could do some work experience in those places and they'd welcome you with open arms. Mm. And you'd, you'd, in, in, in a short space of time, you get a grounding from there, which mm. will mm. do you. No. Be I good, be great. I think I think you probably like maybe we get emails. Would you like to come and work? I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it needs an understanding of what it is. It's not, and I think there's food writing, there's food photography, there's so many things. But you need to understand what right, food yeah, is absolutely. about, and it's not. Right, we have one more question. A lady over there with the glasses. There you go. Put your hand up. Is there one word or one sentence? If this is the last question, that each one of you could give us about. Le Gavroche that we can all take home in our hearts with us? Mm. Oh, lovely question to end with. Well. Um, the leg one, one word? <laughs> legacy. Legacy. Leg legacy. The legacy. Mm. That the name will, the name will live with us for, forever. And the Gavroche is song, is, the name is synonymous with quality, yeah. tradition, and um, a solidity that very few other businesses catering businesses have in this country. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So leg legacy is the word that I would use. Family. Family. Family, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I, yeah. I definitely grew up with them. Yeah, and family in the in the meaning of family, yes, but, but also... But also family is in... The wider range. Yeah. 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 Mm. I, w I would say uh, hospitality and generosity. Generosity, I think. Yes. You've never... I know, as you said, Emily, earlier, you could pick the phone up to your dad and that's different, but you've never felt that you couldn't have called Albert once you knew you were part of the family to a degree um, or picked up your phone to your uncle or called you, which I know I've done and I've called Alan, or what do you think about this? So I think there's a huge generosity of person that you, your family have always done for people in the industry and the wider audience, I yeah. think, yeah. Agreed. For me... Um Souffle Suisse. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Yeah. We did. We did clock up over a million souffle Suisse over the fifty-seven years. So yeah, I think it's apt that we finish on the souffle Suisse. I think that's brilliant. Well, listen, I can't thank you enough, Stephen Doherty, <laughs> Chef Michel, Emily. You. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, Stephen, Michelle, and of course, our fabulous chair, Angela. That was the most beautiful conversation and such a fitting tribute to Le Gavroche. I wanted to just ask everybody here, could everybody who did have the opportunity to eat at Le Gavroche, maybe put your hands up? Ooh, a lot of, so there's a lot of people here for whom this would have been so evocative and reminiscent. And then for those of us that didn't have the opportunity to go, I feel like you really brought it to life for us all. So thank you so much. This really was the perfect start to the food season 2024, and we're hugely grateful. We've got so much more to come. Do check out the amazing events which are unfolding over the next month. The next one coming up is on the 13th. It's going to be a total hoot. We've got... Uh, 
uh, some of the best food writers and chefs, 10 of them coming, sharing their favorite pieces of food writing. Could be things they hate, could be things they love, with the hero who is uh, the Honey Co. chef and proprietor, Itamar Shulevic, in conversation on the 13th, that's Monday. So do try and come to that. There's many more other things. There's an amazing weekend, the big weekend of back-to-back -back events on the 24th and the 25th. Food events for absolutely everyone packed into one amazing weekend. So just check out all of our incredible uh, events. I wanted you all to uh, know that we have got Angela Hartnett's wonderful book, Outside. So please do buy a copy. We should, of course, have the brilliant Rue books here as well. Uh, there's been a, a kerfuffle with where they were sent to. So <laughs> oh, no. We're, oh, no. we're so sorry, but I can I, rest assured they're available at all reputable bookshops, online and in person, <laughs> and you really should buy them because they're absolutely um, fantastic. Um, so this just remains for me to say, check out the food season. Thank you so much for being yeah. here. I didn't say it, the audio. Oh, this yeah. is what I want to say. A huge shout out to Joe Allen, our fantastic food, um, food season assistant, who, thank you, Angela, who so carefully and so cleverly selected those extracts mm. of Albert talking mm. from the um, sound. Yes. Yeah. 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 We have. We have the most amazing collection of food oral histories at the British Library. Hundreds and hundreds of hours of people involved in the food industry talking about food, including Albert. We have eight hours of his recording, and Joe sat and listened to that wonderful conversation and selected those for you to hear. So, yeah, check out our amazing food oral histories as well. Thank you to you. You've been a wonderful audience, and mostly thank you to our panel and to Angela. Thank you.